Welcome to In the Word, a study of the International Bible School lesson. Join Dr. Lee Magnus, Professor Emeritus of Bible, and Dr. Bill Gwaltney, Professor Emeritus of Bible, both from Milligan College, as they bring you their thoughts and knowledge of the study of the Sunday School lesson for the day. Now, here is Dr. Gwaltney. Welcome, friends, t- uh, this morning to our gathering uh, around the Word, where we have been studying a really fantastic part of Paul's writing, uh, the first eight chapters of his letter to the Romans. And we will finish that section this morning, and we pray God's grace upon us to help us do that, Lee. Yeah, it's, a, it's a wonderful climax to this uh, study that we've been having here. Uh, we have more lessons in Romans, but this is the first big section of the letter. Yes. And we come to the, the be- it's almost poetic. It's so beautifully written, uh, but also so theologically significant. As well, well. M- remind us, um, what, what, what was Paul trying to do in writing this letter? Yeah, Paul wants to make contact with a growing church in the capital city of the empire, Rome. Paul's never been there. He knows a lot of people who have gone there to live and to be part of that congregation, but he has never had direct personal contact with the congregation. He wants to establish that contact because Paul was good at intercongregational communication. But he also wants to use them as a springboard to Western evangelism. He'd already been been to Syria and Turkey and Greece, and now he wants to move on to Italy and on west to Spain. He liked to use certain places as um, centers out of which to work. He had used Antioch and then uh, Corinth Corinth and then Ephesus. Ephesus, And now he wants to use Rome in the same way. Right, and then go on to Spain. Yeah. Uh, this, so he, he was westward oriented. He was, go west young man. And um, that, the fact that he wants to write to them gives him a unique opportunity to just take a step back from all the problems that Christian congregations face day by day and just lay out for them his understanding of God's work in Christ. There are a few little places, hints, <clears throat> here and there through this letter that there may be uh, some people out there who don't understand his uh, basic ideas uh, and teachings about salvation. And, right. and he wants to make sure that they understand fully, it seems to me, mm-hmm. exactly what he uh, teaches. Yes, that's and, true. Uh, Christ is the center of his gospel. Yeah. And he wants to make sure they understand uh, that. Right. Um, we know that there were active opponents to Paul in Corinth and in uh, the Galatian churches, central Turkey. Yes. We don't know if there were active opponents in Rome. But they've heard some rumors, you know, like uh, Paul doesn't respect the Mosaic law or things like that. Well, he's anti-Jewish. Yes. And so he Which does... Which is kind of quaint because he <laughs> yeah. himself is a Jew. Right. <laughs> so he does need to put some of those fears at rest, uh, even as he lays out his grand understanding of God's saving work right. in Christ. So it's given this, this us this beautiful section where he starts off with our need for salvation, everyone's need for salvation, and then everyone has the same means of salvation. Jews aren't saved in one way, Gentiles No matter another. what your uh, what your background is, which, yes. uh, it, it, you're saved by the the justifying work of Jesus Christ. Yes, and, and faith in and him. And our faith in him. Yes. And then he moves on and says, now this has implications for the way we live. We can't we don't live under law anymore. We don't, we, we don't live lives of sin anymore. That's just incompatible right. with our and, new loyalty. And he's faced with a real problem. If we are not under the law of mm-hmm. Moses and we're not under Roman law mm-hmm. or Greek law or somebody else's law, mm-hmm. what controls 
our decision making, what controls our practice. Right. And that's why in uh, life, chapter you know? seven and eight are so important because what we have here is his exploration of what we are no longer under and what we are now under. Chapter yes. seven, which, which we're skipping in our lesson series here. It's not uh, included in right, the printed text. Right. Yes. But chapter seven talks mainly about law and how we are not under law anymore. Yes. Chapter eight is gonna talk about the alternative, which is spirit. And we're going to get a dichotomy, another uh, one of his several dichotomies, mm -hmm. uh, that is a pair of opposites. Right. Uh, and it's uh, law versus spirit. Spirit, right. We've had sin and righteousness, or yes. sin and grace, uh, and now we have law and spirit. So in chapter 7, he, he reiterates the fact that we simply... Uh, are not under law anymore. That yes. We have a new means of relating to God. Now, uh, oddly enough, as he's saying that, in the back of his mind, he's remembering these critics who are saying, oh, we're not under law anymore. What are you, what are you saying about the Mosaic law, that God goofed or that the law is bad? It was unnecessary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, right. And so he has to pause in the middle of chapter 7 and say, no, 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 I'm not saying that the law is bad at all. It's just that the law had limitations. Right. It, it, it accomplished certain things that were wonderful, but it also had limitations. Well, uh, you, you have a pre-law era in the Bible, then you mm -hmm. have the era of the law, mm -hmm. uh, but now we live in a new era uh, which is uh, described as the era of Christ. Yeah. And Christ is superior to both of the previous eras, uh, especially uh, the era uh, of law. As mm -hmm. important and significant as the law of Moses was, mm -hmm. still it does not measure up to the standards of being in Christ, right. in the spirit of Christ. And so he concludes chapter 7 with this great cry in verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, because the law couldn't save us, but, but Jesus can. And uh, he, de and he spent a whole lot of words yeah. demonstrating right. why the law could not right. be our savior. Yeah. But now when we move into chapter eight, uh, we have his discussion of how we do live in Christ under the spirit. And these opening verses of chapter eight, which are not in our printed text, uh, kind of set the tone for that. Yes. And uh, the emphasis now, right from the very beginning of chapter 8, is going to be on the Spirit. Verse 2 says, uh, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Yeah. And from that point on, he starts defining the role of the Spirit in directing us mm -hmm. Uh, and even helping us to pray, yes, uh, as well as directing us into sensitivity mm -hmm. as to what the mind of Christ would be in a given situation. Right, the inter and the intercessory work of the Spirit. Yes, I'm. I'm so glad you read that. Was chapter eight, verse two that Dr. Gwaltney just read, um, because it has the three key terms: law, sin, and death. Yes. And as I mentioned last week, that's one, a bundle. One way of viewing this whole section, chapters five, six, seven, and eight, is to remember these three key things: because of the justifying work of Christ, and because of our faith in Him, we are no, we are now free from law, free from sin, and free from death. And there it is. And there are all three concepts in that one verse. Right in that one verse. And uh, yeah, and the the spirit. We, uh, he will say, we walk by the Spirit. And that's also in Galatians. Right. right. And what, is it, what does that mean? Um, we walk yeah, by the, the Spirit. The idea of walk is, is a way of viewing our whole life as a journey toward God. Yes. And so we walk with a guide. We, 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 don't, just, we don't just wander around. We have a guide. Yeah. The, the Spirit of, of God uh, commissioned by Christ to be uh, our guide. And so our walk is in the spirit in the sense that, uh, that God's spirit continues to guide us. I think this uh, is probably one of the most difficult things 
to understand and to articulate. Because when you ask most Christians, um, you know, what determines uh, what action you take or what mm -hmm. you say in any given situation, mm -hmm. uh, it usually turns out to be what is legal, as if legal is mm -hmm. moral. Right. Uh, the two are equal mm -hmm. to one another. Mm -hmm. And that is the, the very opposite of pa what Paul is saying here. Yeah. It's the law of Moses, as good as it was, still was an imperfect guide for, for your life yeah. in Christ. We're called to an immensely higher standard than what is legal. And even what our society generally views as moral. We are, we are called to have the mind of Christ in yes. us and have that mind of Christ uh, guide every action, thought, and relationship. And how do we know the mind of Christ? Well, it's the Spirit uh, right. who leads us into that understanding. It's, it, that makes, uh -huh. I think, the Gospels in the New Testament so very, very important. Yes. But also the, the letters deal with specific situations yeah. <clears throat> where decisions are to be made on a number of different mm -hmm. issues. Yeah. You know, I, I, I answered your question, how do we know how to live, by saying the Spirit guides us. Uh, let me, I just realize I should add another related answer to that question. Uh, when Paul was asked that question, he said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. In other words, we know about Jesus, what he taught and how he lived. And so we can actually imitate him in comparable yes. circumstances in our lives. Well, and we all know <clears throat> nowadays that uh, mo modeling mm -hmm. is so very important yeah. in helping children to grow up to be uh, good citizens. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same pr principle mm -hmm. in, in, in the Christian life. Right. Well, let's, let's move to our uh, printed text here, and it's the conclusion of this grand first eight chapter section uh, before he turns to a completely different More topic. More than conquerors okay. is our topic. Very good. Well, I'm going to start reading then at Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, that's a mouthful. What a glorious <coughs> passage. And that's the summation, yeah. the uh, ending, the conclusion of this whole discussion of how are we saved? What right. is, <coughs> how, how is, do, uh, we're saved by law? No. no. We're saved by, yeah. because of the grace of God. Mm -hmm. 
uh, through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, we, we need to make it clear that faith is more than just uh, agreeing to with a group of uh, statements. A set of principles or something like that. Yeah, as important as that may be. Right, right. But it's more than that. For Paul, faith is a whole life response to God. Yes. And his saving work in Christ. Uh, yeah. So it, it's how we think, it's what we believe. Trust. And it's, it's trust. It's trust. It's also, though, how we live our daily lives, yes. walk in faith, walk in the Spirit, and how we relate to other people. And All of that's involved in what he means by faith. Exactly. It's not just... It's not just uh, mental... Uh, you know, yeah. Academic life. Right. Now, we begin with verse 28. Oh, my. Yeah. Okay, now, let's, let's this tackle is, this statement. Yeah, th this is a good translation of verse 28, but I want to point out that um, the translation that some of us still use and all of us still love and respect is the King James Version. And yes. it has a different translation here. And I just, I want to clarify that uh, because this is the the, the translation that's still in the mind of many of us uh, was not accurate. Let's first look at what it says. In all things, by which he means in all circumstances of life, yes. God is at work for the good. Now, for whom? G bringing about good for whom? For those who love him and are called according to God's purpose. Yes. Now, that's what it says. The King James said, all things work together for good. Not right. God is working for good, but all things work together for good. And that has led to a great confusion in the minds of many Christians. Yes. Don't you think? Absolutely. Yeah. Because, unfortunately, uh, sometimes we get to thinking, well, you know, a disaster has occurred. Mm -hmm. All right, what are we to make of this disaster? Well, God made it happen, and but He's it, so, He's going to bring something good out of it, and um, I don't think that's what this verse is saying. No. no, it doesn't say that all things work together for the good. It says that in all circumstances, God is working to bring about some good. So some Christians uh, sit around and try to figure out, man. What was good about the attacks on 9-11? Yeah. Or what was good about a massacre shooting someplace at an elementary school? Or what's good about me getting cancer? And we, 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 we try to go through these mental gymnastics of trying yes. to figure out what's good yeah. about something that's horrible or evil. Mm -hmm. And because of, the, of a mistranslation of this verse, we don't have to do that. What we just, we have to just relax and say, in all circumstances, they may be evil. They may be terrorism. They're not caused by God. No, they're not caused by God. And they don't bring about good. Cancer in and of itself doesn't bring about good. Right. Brings about death. Terrorist attacks in and of themselves don't bring about good. Yeah. They bring about terrible grief and suffering. But we live, Paul says, in the confidence that no matter how horrible our circumstances may be, God is still at work through His Spirit in our lives to bring about good results. Now, there's another element here that I, uh, to me is very significant, and that is partnership with God. Good point. And uh, that's involved, I think, in the verb that you used. It here, is, isn't yes, it? and it, and that is left out of our NIV translation. In all things, God works for the good, is what our translation says. But in the Greek, it says works together with us to bring about the good. So what yes. we have here is a beautiful cooperation in life between God's will and our will. Right, mm -hmm. and. and um, I look at life uh, very much as this, that we are called to be partners with God in rescuing people mm -hmm. and, and situations and rescuing the world in which we live. Really? Yeah, we have a, a wonderful and high role in, uh, in participating in the reconciling work of God in the world. 
Let's look at verses 29 and following mm -hmm. because I think that these verses also need uh, some explanation. For mm -hmm. one thing, I, while you were reading, uh, something popped out of the text for me. Mm -hmm. Be conformed to the image of his son. Yes. And there is modeling. It is. Exactly. There it is. Yeah. As yeah. you said, mm -hmm. uh, Paul once wrote, um, be imitators of me as I imitate, to maybe even to the extent mm -hmm. that I imitate Christ. Right. And this, this is a beautiful uh, phrase here. It goes all the way back to creation in Genesis chapter 1, where we learn that we were created in the image and likeness of God. Yes. Sin has, has marred that image. The, the, the image is yes. bad, like, a, like an ancient statue that had the nose knocked off or something. We're, we're a badly <laughs> yeah. marred image of God. But Maybe a little worse than the nose. Worse than just a nose, okay. <laughs> but the work of Christ has made it possible. God working through Christ has made it possible to once again be conformed to the image of His Son in whom we see the nature of God yes. displayed. Well, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the exactly. Father. Exactly, yeah. Now, the other thing that's interesting about verse 29 is that th this word predestination comes up. Yeah. Some Christians um, interpret, have a view of predestination, which suggests that God has pre-chosen a, a, a limited number, a certain limited number of people uh, to be his elect and that uh, these benefits come only yes. to them. Yeah. Um, my understanding is somewhat different, and feel free to, exp to disagree with me if, if you wish or to agree. My understanding is that what we have in biblical predestination, in Paul's view of predestination, is an understanding of what God's will for the whole human race was. What is desire? What is aim? Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. Um, and, and I think we, we are pretty clear on that. I mean, let's just go back to John 3, 16, right? Yes. For God so loved, it doesn't say for God so loved the elect. It no, says the God, world. The world. And generally the world in the New Testament is not all good. Right. It, it means the inhabited world. It means yeah. all human beings. Yeah. It doesn't mean the planet. It means the human beings who inhabit the world. Yes. Good, bad, and otherwise. God loves them all, all human beings, and sent His Son for all of them. And we also have yes. clearly uh, stated that Christ died for all, not just, right. not just for the elect, yes. uh, not for just for a small now, group. I th you, you said something before we uh, started recording mm -hmm. that uh, the term predestination actually in the Greek language has mm -hmm. something to do with the horizon. It Explain does. That. It's, it's related to the, this word horizon. It's, um, and, and so the horizon is what we see off in the far distance. And I think that's a good clue of how we should understand predestination. I, I believe in predestination in, in what I think is a biblical view of it, which is that predestination is what God's long-term universal plan was, God's wish, God's was will, and is. God's purpose was yep. and is, that all people be reconciled to Him. As He says in 1 Corinthians 5, that the whole world be reconciled yep. to Him. Um, now, that doesn't mean that that turns out, because as no. we've learned from earlier in Romans, all of this depends on our faith in Jesus Christ. Yes. And so our response plays a role in, in uh, the, this plan of, of God. But the, yes. the plan is that all people yeah. be reconciled. However, to it's a choice. It is. And uh, it, it appears that God has determined from the very beginning that human beings uh, get to be like Him in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And one of them is to make choices. Make choices. And uh, so we, what God wants of us and what Christ wants of us mm -hmm. is for us to make a choice 
for him. Exactly. And turn to God through Christ. Yeah, we have to, in other words, we have to choose to be chosen. Choose to God be chosen. God chooses us, but we have to choose to be chosen. Yes. Well, we've taken so much time on these opening few verses that um, there's a lot more left here that we're not going to get to talk about in detail. Let me just say that I think there are three main sections of this that, that what are, we read of, of the printed text that our, our viewers might want to use in their study or in their teaching. The first few verses, 28 through 30, is about who is at work in our lives? And the answer is God is at work. Yes. The second question, starting in verse 31, is, well, then who is working against us? Uh -huh. And his answer is, you know what? It, it doesn't really matter. Nothing that is at work against us is That's going to be That's a whole list of successful. things uh, down in uh, 38 and following. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it really, almost is everything in the world. Yeah, and, and might it, work against us. Yeah, and there's another list in 35: uh, trouble, yeah. hardship, persecution, all that. That's a yeah. list working against. And he says uh, it, it doesn't really matter because if God is for us, now I'm back in 31. Yes, it doesn't matter who's against us. And that if we've right. talked about ifs before. Yes, this is the if, if and it is so. And it is so. Yeah. If God and is there for are a us, lot of things against us. Yeah, there are. But if God is for us and God is for us, it doesn't matter how many things are against us. Then the third section here, I think in verses 37 and following, is the question, well, what does this make of me? Or, so what are we? Yes. And he says, uh, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Not on because we have self-esteem. Exact. Or... or or yeah, self-power <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. It's all about the love of Christ. Yes. As he says uh, back up in uh, verse 35, yes. love of Christ. And it's about the love of God, as he says in verse 39. I think it's interesting right at the end of the statement in 39 that the relationship between God the Father and Christ the Son um, are worked together mm -hmm. so that we see how they are involved in this whole process of salvation and living a, a, a life that conquers the evil. That um, the love of God mm -hmm. is expressed in Jesus Christ our Lord. Right. And we also see in this chapter the parallel work of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit. Because in yes. verse 26, we see that the Holy Spirit intercedes. And then here, we learn that Christ intercedes for us as well. Right. Yeah. Now, it's too bad that we didn't get a chance to explore the Holy Spirit as a controlling factor, but mm -hmm. um, I think our viewers will certainly be able to read this section uh, perceptively and understand that it is the spirit that guides us exactly uh, in yeah. life and the yeah. decisions that we make, not law. Right. And, and the, the, the final point is to remember that when it says we are more than conquerors, that doesn't make us the champions. No. It God makes, is the champion Right. Here. Through his yeah, spirit through and the, the spirit yeah. of Christ. Exactly. Well, we didn't get everything in as usual, and, but we hope that you have received some guidance and some ideas that will lead you in uh, your Christian walk. We will be in Romans again uh, next week, but we'll move into a new section uh, with a new uh, theme. Come back and join us and God be with you this week. This has been In the Word, a study of the International Bible School lesson with Dr. Lee Magnus, Professor Emeritus of Bible from Milligan College, and Dr. Bill Gwaltney, Professor Emeritus of Bible of Milligan College. Join us again next week for another lesson from the International Bible School lesson text. This has been a production of the First Christian Church Television Ministries.